Okay, uh, good morning everyone and welcome everyone to our session on nuclear threats and international security. Um, I'm So Young Kim, Reuters Korea Bureau Chief. Uh, nuclear security is a very topical issue at the moment and um, in a few days at Davos, we are going to hear US President Donald Trump talking about North Korea and Iran, among other issues. Um, the developments in North Korea over the past year have been alarming, with Trump and Kim Jong-un exchanging threats of a nuclear war. Uh, only a few weeks ago, the two have been talking about who's got a bigger nuclear button. Uh, in Iran, after world power spent years to negotiate a deal to curb Iran's nuclear program, that's facing an uncertain future, uh, with Trump refusing to accept it as it is. Um, we have an ongoing nuclear rivalry between India and Pakistan, um, and existing nuclear weapon states are modernizing their arsenal, led by the United States and Russia, um, and the upcoming nuclear posture review from Washington is expected to call for a greater role of nuclear weapons um, in U.S. defense strategy. So it's a very uh, you know, great time to discuss um, this issue, and we've got a great panel for that today. Uh, let me briefly introduce um, the speakers. To my left is um, Minister, um, uh, Minister uh, M.J. Akbar, Minister of State for External Affairs of India, and he's also an author of several books on India and Pakistan. Uh, we have Yuichi Funabashi, chairman of Asia Pacific Initiative. He's one of Japan's leading commentators on foreign affairs. And we've got Beatrice Finn, executive director of the ICANN, International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. ICANN, as you know, uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize last year, uh, recognized for its work drawing attention to this very important issue and getting the UN General Assembly to adopt a nuclear prohibition treaty last year. Um, so uh, I'd like for us to take a step back for a moment and sort of, you know, examine the issue of, examine why the issue of nuclear weapons and why the specter of a nuclear war is back on the table decades after the Cold War ended. Uh, let me kick it off with Yuichi. So, you know, uh, in uh, answering uh, to your question, why now, all of a sudden, I'd like to offer a couple of uh, uh, comments. The first fact at play uh, is uh, fiery personalities involved in international politics, uh, Kim Jong-un and uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump are mutually unhinged. Uh, Donald Trump uh, takes uh, uh, Nixon's madman theory uh, to new heights. Uh, all his rhetoric and behavior are premised uh, on um, being unpredictable. Uh, making that uh, situation over the Korean Peninsula uh, full of suspenses. And uh, uh, this uh, could uh, lead to uh, unpredictability, uh, could lead to uh, escalation. Uh, he seems to uh, believe that this uh, making everything unpredictable uh, could uh, elevate his leverage, uh, increase his leverage. Uh, deterrence uh, uh, leverage. But uh, as uh, Graham Allison has argued uh, that uh, during 13 days of uh, a Cuban crisis in 1962, uh, there were more than a dozen of instances in which the miscommunication, misperceptions, misunderstanding between the United States and Soviet Union could have led to a nuclear war. So you must not underestimate this uh, danger of unpredictability. Uh, second uh, aspect, uh, factor, uh, is uh, uh, North Korea's uh, psychology and uh, uh, ideology. Uh, North Korea now uh, has seen uh, a, a nuclear weapon as the ultimate deterrence. Uh, they have uh, become uh, convinced that uh, nuclear weapons are necessary for their uh, regime uh, survival. Uh, we should remember that North Korea's nuclear program has uh, preceded uh, Donald Trump's uh, much, much earlier, uh, over the past half century, since 1960s. And after the uh, Cold War ended, it accelerated. 
So uh, by merely increasing the uh, conventional uh, weapons capability, North Korea just cannot match the power uh, of uh, South Korea, supported by the United States, North Korea, uh, South Korea's ally, and uh, uh, alliance networks in the Asia Pacific. So uh, through that uh, nuclear weapon, North Korea is trying to ensure the unification of the uh, two Koreas, uh, which means uh, eventual uh, dismantle of uh, the United States military presence uh, on the South Korea. Okay. And uh, perhaps uh, North, uh, North Korea will attempt to uh, weaken and neutralize the ROK-US alliance. And then uh, uh, it will likely attempt to uh, engage that uh, regional uh, powers, players, uh, in nuclear blackmail. So um, this is a really uh, a real clear uh, present threat uh, to the neighboring countries, particularly from Japanese perspectives. Uh, uh, it had uh, two North Korea's missiles flown over the uh, uh, archipelago uh, just in the last year. Okay? Uh, one landed uh, 370 kilometers uh, from ashore. So uh, uh, North Korea actually made it very crystal clear to Japan uh, that I quote, uh, that it wants that four islands of Japanese archipelago should be sunk into the sea by that nuclear bomb of Chuche. Okay? Uh, it was an official uh, comment uh, in reaction to Jap Japan's uh, voting in uh, United Nations Security Council sanctions resolution in September last year. So um, even though I think that we ought to aim for that, uh, that uh, nuclear abolition, a nuclear free world, and uh, we have uh, very much you know, lauded and commended that, that uh, you know, ICANN's uh, activities, and also it's very encouraging to see that this uh, you know, nuclear ban uh, abolition a treaty. But uh, it certainly, uh, we hope, and many majority of the Japanese public also supports and encouraged uh, to see that uh, this makes a uh, conducive uh, international environment uh, for this uh, to be uh, uh, realized. But at the same time, uh, uh, you know, we must realize uh, that, uh, that we, have, uh, we are confronted with that very clear present threat. Okay? So um, I, th I don't think it, this is a mutually exclusive okay, the aspiration for eventual uh, nuclear free world. And the step by step, uh, uh, you know, uh, to uh, treatment and uh, of uh, the uh, addressing that uh, this nuclear threat from North Korea. But okay. yeah, but given that we have very present threats from North Korea, do you think there is a greater risk of, of a nuclear arms race in the region and globally? Uh, for example, in Japan, I think um, going nuclear still has been much of a, a taboo, uh, but that hasn't stopped commentators in Washington from suggesting that perhaps Japan um, and also South Korea should consider going nuclear in order to counter North Korea. Do you think that gaining any momentum at all? It seems to uh, gain a little bit more currency uh, in some uh, circle in Washington. Uh, first, I think that it's more uh, sort of tactical. Uh, the logic is to uh, put pressure on China to act on North Korea by using Japan. Okay? Uh, so this is designed to address that the nuclear threat uh, uh, from North Korea. At the most recently, a very different kind of logic has emerged in my life. It's more worrying to me. That is that uh, the primary uh, threat, uh, perceived threat, comes from China. Okay. So geopolitical ambition of China uh, would be contained by nuclear, nuclearizing Japan and uh, Korea, even Taiwan. Uh, then the United States should uh, withdraw the troops from South Korea, cut the defense budget, and then let the America's allies pay the cost 
to contain China. This is much more strategic, okay? It's still limited to fringes of the policy circle, but I think that we really have to be very, very careful of that. Uh, this option does not exist in Japan, okay? Uh, this is not tenable, as, as you said. Uh, let me go to Minister Akbar and uh, sort of hear the perspectives from a nuclear weapon state. Why do you think more countries are pursuing nuclear weapons and what makes it so attractive for the countries and, and why do you think it makes them feel safer? Well, countries see uh, nuclear weapons as the ultimate deterrence. It's all a question of whether you are sending a missile or a message. That said, I can speak for my country's record, India's. Just a few days ago, we joined the Australia group. A little before that, we joined Wasimar. As you are well aware, we had the, we had the NSG waiver uh, when we did the nuclear deal with uh, the United States. All this is evidence of what we know, and now the world recognizes, that India is a very responsible nuclear state. Uh, I think almost every criteria that is required for, in order to define responsibility has been met by us. And met by us not because anyone asked us to do so, but met because we wanted to do so. Uh, every year in the United Nations, in the first committee, we introduce uh, three resolutions seeking a step-by-step -step approach towards reducing uh, the dangers we recognize, uh, of course, everybody in his rational senses recognizes the dangers. But our approach is equally clear, that we would like a nuclear regime that is universal, that is non-discriminatory, and that is verifiable. And I think uh, these parameters are acceptable to the world. Uh, and therefore, we get the support uh, from uh, various countries. The, uh, we believe that uh, this will uh, be further augmented, hopefully, in the uh, near future. And uh, we also hope that the world will work towards reducing, if not eliminating, the dangers. Uh, on a separate level, on a question that you asked, uh, my friend here, you know, the, uh, one of the theories that has kept uh, the world still free of nuclear war since uh, the Second World War is uh, a theory aptly, I suppose, described as MAD, mutually assured destruction. And, uh, you know, the history of humankind says that uh, people in power have been really, really worried about destruction. But everyone takes self-destruction seriously. So uh, that said, we cannot at all ignore the need to work towards a, uh, a world in which this threat uh, uh, leaves us or goes away as soon as possible. When people are worried about the specter of a nuclear war, but also there are often fears cited um, by people of countries, um, you know, nuclear, having nuclear weapons make countries more maybe belligerent or providing the cover for more belligerent conventional action. And um, take India and Pakistan, for, for example. Yes, nuclear weapons have not been used. There was no large scale a war, but we have continued clashes along the border. So what do you have to say to that? We can only speak uh, from uh, our position. I can obviously cannot speak on behalf of, of another country. Uh, we, 
as I have said, have these weapons as a form of deterrence. Uh, we believe uh, we believe then in no first use. We hope that this in the process of a step by step approach that we can get agreement from the world on no first use. It would be an important important step forward in a process. Uh, I've always personally believed uh, in a philosophy uh, of governance wherein we must never sacrifice the good in search of the ideal. So if the ideal cannot be achieved as soon as we would all wish, at least, at least we can work towards the good. And I think that really is, uh, is a realistic option before the world. Mm -hmm. One of the things I do want to say, actually, is, uh, you know, very often world affairs, uh, you know, it's easy to hear the noise. It's slightly less easy to hear the silence. And there has been a great deal of silence about proliferation. People with a track record of proliferation have been allowed to get away. And then suddenly, when you see an expansion of weaponization, we all uh, uh, pretend to look very startled. Um, so I'd like to ask Beatrice, uh, Minister Akbar mentioned that India is a responsible nuclear state, um, and countries like United States also say that they are a responsible nuclear state, but other countries with nuclear weapons, um, North Korea, for example, cannot be trusted. What's your view on that? I think first we need to really look what, at what nuclear weapons are. Uh, these are the most inhumane, indiscriminate weapon that has ever been created. And the nuclear arms states don't usually like to talk about the weapons themselves. They like to put it into geopolitics, strategy, balance of power. But these are weapons that are meant to mass murder civilians, indiscriminately slaughter as many people as possible as quickly as possible. They, if you use any use of nuclear weapons, would immediately cause hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of casualties, depending on where it's used. It would burn and poison survivors. It will keep killing people decades after the weapon has been used. How responsible is that? And that is plans and preparations right now in all the nuclear armed states and the military allies of these states that are participating in that. They are planning and preparing for being using these weapons on people. So I think it's, it's really important to remember that when we talk about nuclear weapons, that these are inhumane, indiscriminate weapons. And of course, no one really wants to use nuclear weapons. Uh, most nuclear arms says it's just for deterrence. But if we look at deterrence, what it really means, um, having these about, what, 15,000 nuclear warheads still uh, around, uh, pointing at cities and people all over the world, um, if we don't get rid of them, they will be used. And this is not just fear mongering. Statistically speaking, ask a mathematician, the risk is always greater than zero. Right now, it's, qu it's quite high. We see an increased tension with an increased risk. But as long as they exist, if we keep these weapons forever, they will be used. I think that's really just important to make that kind of point, that they will be used and people will die. It can be a mistake. It can be an accident. It can be non-state actor attacks, cyber attacks. Um, and I think that sort of this assumption that we have that some governments are rational actors this is sort of a, a sane security policy. It's really starting to, to fall apart today. Uh, we see two nuclear armed states that are threatening to use them. Uh, and with that also comes increased preparations from their military, uh, increased nervousness. Um, just this last week, we saw what happened in Hawaii. Uh, that could have been another, it could have been, what if that alert had gone directly to Trump? What would his response would have been? What if the North Koreans would have thought, for example, that that was just an excuse to start an invasion and would have thought that maybe we better launch first? So I think that this kind of scenario that we have right now is really extremely problematic. And we see all the nuclear armed states going in, in the wrong direction. Uh, we have this new Trump policy uh, that's gonna come out in nuclear posture review. 
uh, that lowers the, the possibility of use of nuclear weapons. Uh, it develops new types of uh, nuclear weapons, low yield. And just remember that by today's standard, the average size of today's nuclear weapons is much, much bigger than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So if you look at the, the size today, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs are considered low yield. And that would be more, the, the policy says that they will be more likely to use them then. Do we really need Trump with more, you know, feel more able to use nuclear weapons? But we also see, for example, there was an Indian ICBM test last week, um, a responsible government practicing, testing its capabilities to slaughter civilians, wipe out entire cities. I think this is a very concerning trend. And I think that the only option we have, if we do not want nuclear weapons to be used, we have to get rid of them. I think that's just, we can't keep these weapons uh, if, we don't want them, if we don't want to deal with the consequences of their use. So of course the, the only option is to work to prohibit and eliminate them. And while we're seeing this very negative trend amongst nuclear armed states with increased threats and sort of trying to lower the threshold for using these weapons, we also see a very positive movement uh, where the majority of states in the world are committing to uh, have negotiated a treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons and are committing legally to say we will never use, possess, or develop these weapons. And I think that's, that's the pathway forward. Mm -hmm. uh, these kind of, of course you can make, you can do step by step, like steps to reduce the risks, but as long as they exist, we will have to deal with the consequences of their use eventually. Mm -hmm. So it's very urgent that we move towards, uh, towards disarmament. And we have this framework right now with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the way forward. Um, you know, one of the challenges is that we are at a situation where the established nuclear weapon states aren't, are not abolishing their weapons. And in fact, they are modernizing it, uh, making it better. At the same time, they are telling others not to develop. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem to be much trust or confidence in the minds mm. of the uh, prospective nuclear states. So I wonder what, uh, what can the nuclear states you know, do on their part to mm. discourage proliferation and, and sort of you know, give the trust to nuclear wannabes mm. that this is not the path forward? Well, I think you have to stop thinking that deterrence solves all your problems uh, and argue that nuclear weapons are necessary for security. I mean, we see even countries in, in Europe, for example, today, that are part of the nuclear umbrella in, in through NATO, for example, that are arguing that we need to threaten to mass murder civilians in order to feel safe. If a country uh, in sort of, you know, in Western Europe, for example, needs to have that as their security policy, how can we demand that North Korea isn't going to think the same way? Why do we put higher demands on humanitarian law in North Korea than Norway, for example? Uh, so I think it's, it's just, we have to start looking at this. And if we believe in nuclear deterrence, if we think that nuclear weapons creates peace and stability, then why aren't we welcoming North Korea's nuclear weapons? Why aren't we saying that that improves the situation in the region? Because actually, it, it doesn't. I mean, I think that we see right now that this conflict, this sort of, we're getting, we're heading towards wars in the region. And that is fueled by nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are creating the crisis rather than solving and preventing it. Mr. Akbar, could you respond to that? of security uh, simply cannot be wished away. Uh, it's um, easy and I, we all know what nuclear weapons can inflict. We have evidence from Japan. But as I said in the beginning, any step forward cannot be discriminatory. It has to be universal. You cannot take a position that, uh, you know, a particular region's, uh, you cannot take a position that uh, a particular region start acting unilaterally. We are in Europe. There are three European nuclear states. Uh, why don't they lead the way? What about India? No, I'm sitting in Europe. We'll discuss India in mm -hmm. Delhi. Mm -hmm. 
why don't, why don't three European states lead the way? Well, obviously they have governments which have an understanding of security. I don't know, I haven't seen any poll, but uh, supposing we ask these three European countries to take an opinion poll on whether their people, the publics, would like unilateral disarmament or not. And what do you think the answer of the opinion polls will be? And the people know, of course, that they will pay the price. Now, I have said in the beginning, I said in the middle, and I say again, that we, are, uh, we believe in a sense of responsibility, our duty, not only to our own people, but to the world. We work very strongly through the multilateral framework, particularly the United Nations. We introduce three resolutions every year, repeatedly, through the first committee. We urge other nations to take steps in a step-by-step -step approach, which is through the multilateral framework, which is the only way forward, right? And uh, we hope that this, uh, this uh, diligence with which we work towards a safer world uh, will get the response. In the meantime, we do also take the opportunity of uh, reminding the world of the dangers of proliferation, of the need <coughs> to act against proliferation, we question why there is no step, why no steps are taken against proliferation. And while the world is full of questions, maybe uh, as our friend says, the, uh, there should be some answers too. Uh, Yunis, do you agree that the multilateral framework is the way to go to discourage uh, proliferation? When uh, NPT was ratified in 1970s, uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, there were five nuclear weapon states uh, declared and recognized one. Uh, and certainly it was discriminatory uh, in, the sen in the sense that uh, it favored that, uh, that those who already had uh, nuclear weapons uh, des des designified, uh, uh, designated, I should say, as a, an entitled to be a legitimate nuclear power, whereas the others, aspirants, are banned. So it's unfair, structurally. And the tally now is nine, right? So uh, the effectiveness of that, this multilateral framework uh, also is questionable. But at the same time, uh, in so far as that, uh, the, uh, the nuclear, there was no nuclear war. Uh, over the, uh, the past uh, 40 years, actually it was effective, uh, even though it, it's very much insufficient. So uh, we have to uh, realize that it is very much insufficient, incomplete arrangement, but uh, it's not time for us to dismantle that. We have to, uh, I think, repair it and strengthen it. And I, on that account, I think that the President Obama was really right on the mark. And in his praise speech in 2009, he put the onus uh, on the United States and the other uh, nuclear weapon states to do more by reducing that the nuclear weapon in national security strategy. Okay? So this was very new, actually. So I hope, I pin hope on that uh, uh, sane, uh, sanity of that, uh, those nuclear weapon states. Uh, but at the same time, I think we also need that strong pressure uh, from the public in the world to have them done that, to force them to uh, live up to that aspiration. By the way, that concept of deterrence was enshrined, legitimatized in uh, NPT regime. So it would be extremely difficult to expect this concept uh, to be uh, done away with. Otherwise, that actually 
think it's impossible to convince them unless we address the problems of nuclear weapons. I think we cannot expect to prevent proliferation when some other states continue to argue that nuclear weapons are essential for, for security. Uh, if the United States, with, which is the biggest conventional military power, no one else can match them. If they need to threaten to indiscriminately slaughter civilians with mass weapons of mass destruction in order to feel safe, how are we going to be able to convince other countries? It's very much do as I say, not as I do uh, kind of attitude, which I think is really, so we have to address, if we want to prevent proliferation, we're going to have to address nuclear weapons as a whole. Uh, it is not the co which country has them that is the problem, it's the weapon that is the problem. And I think we also have to look at then for all nuclear armed states and potential proliferators, uh, a really sort of what constitutes as a credible and effective defense today. Maybe nuclear weapons have actually makes us all less safe, not just because of the threat, but also because we are not focusing on perhaps proper defense. This is 1945 technology. It's not modern warfare weapon. Uh, the kind of warfare that happens today, it does not focus on leveling entire cities of civilians. We're not actually supposed to take out Moscow. Like that, that doesn't make any military sense in, in any kind of way today. Um, so perhaps continuing to cling on to these outdated weapons of mass destruction actually prevents governments from thinking about what kind of defense is needed in the 21st century. Uh, it, and perhaps that is also a, a big security concern for these sta states. Maybe we, the military needs to think about what kind of security th threats, you know, climate change, uh, terrorism, cyber attacks. You can't fight those things with weapons of mass destruction that spreads radiation for decades. So, Jan, by the way, there are there have been a couple of uh, instances of uh, countries uh, uh, giving up on a nuclear weapon. Uh, South Africa, uh, Brazil, even Ukraine, uh, Korea, and Taiwan. So there are some cases uh, in which that you can expect the countries to eschew, okay, obviate that. Uh, passion and uh, impulse uh, to develop nuclear weapons. Can it be applied to today's situation by any chance? Uh, as far as North Korea is concerned, it, it would be extremely difficult. Even if the, uh, the United States and uh, others would uh, provide that security assurance, as we uh, did in 2005, uh, it didn't uh, do mu uh, much effect. So I think it's very, but realistically speaking, it's very difficult. And that's why increasingly people are discussing um, the possibility, you know, whether the world just should uh, live with a nuclear, I mean, they, the world, whether it has any option but to live with a, a nuclear North Korea. Do you think it's, it's ever an option? Um, and, you know, if that's the case, then would that be a irreparable harm to non-proliferation efforts? I don't know, we don't have uh, any easy answer. Uh, maybe over the long run, uh, it will uh, depends on that North Korea's regime change. Uh, that might lead to some uh, peaceful evolution from within. Uh, that may be one of the scenarios, uh, as exemplified South, Korea, uh, South Africa. Uh, how realistic that the regime change of North Korea uh, would be, I don't know. But uh, North Korean people's uh, income has increased uh, saliently uh, in, the, in the past uh, several years. 75% of that income comes from the market. Okay? So the people gradually has become to be aspirational. If the people really are completely in that bottom, no hope for, for the future, okay? uh, they don't have any incentive to change. But if they start to acquire some aspirations, they want to change. Okay? That could lead to that regime change in the future. I'm too speculative here, I know that.
Thank you. I'm Radek Sikorski, I was Poland's uh, defense and foreign minister. Uh, I'm glad uh, the case of Ukraine was mentioned because, as you know, it's not a happy story. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in the framework of the uh, Budapest Memorandum in which Russia, the United States, and others uh, guaranteed Ukraine's uh, security and borders, and we know what happened. And that's not a very good uh, <laughs> lesson for those right. who would be persuaded to give up their weapons today. I agree. Um, I would like to be nuked as much as you, which is to say, uh, not at all. But when I was defense minister, I uh, declassified um, Cold War era uh, war fighting plans that were uh, in our archives. We were the second uh, army of the Warsaw Pact, including Soviet plans of invasion of Western Europe. And they showed um, that the Soviets were uh, intending to use nuclear weapons from day one on a massive scale mm. against Germany, Denmark, Holland, <coughs> Belgium, but not France and the United Kingdom. You see, if you argue that nuclear deterrence doesn't work, you will not be persuasive because it does. So you need to construct your argument differently. Uh, we have got huge reductions of strategic uh, weapons. And what Norway and Poland have argued for several uh, uh, years now is that we need to do the same with respect to uh, weapons that are completely unregulated today, which is the substrategic tactical level. And there are many more thousands of them. And those are the ones that are much more likely to be used than the, than the big ones. Um, so I would, I would argue, I would agree with you that uh, let, let's focus on what's achievable because these weapons will not be disinvented. Can I ask a yeah. uh, on both points, I think that the Ukraine thing is quite interesting actually, uh, but not perhaps for the same reason as you are implying. I think it would be naive to think that Ukraine could have kept their nuclear weapons and all would have been fine. That they would have been allowed to keep their nuclear weapons, that that wouldn't have triggered a major conflict with Russia. Uh, it's you know, we can have this hypothetical conversation of just placing nuclear weapons in Ukraine today and nothing would have happened. But we could have seen war, nuclear war, uh, accidents, uh, and the world could have looked completely different. So I think it's, it's to just say that nu Ukraine could have kept nuclear weapons and they wouldn't have been invaded today is to discount what would actually have happened if Ukraine would have said to Russia, now we're not going to give them back. That, that would have, I think, gone a completely different way in history and nothing you can predict really what would happen. Um, I think, I'm not saying that nuclear deterrent might not work in certain cases, but you can't 100% guarantee that it will never lead to nuclear use. And you can never guarantee that there will never be an accident, a misunderstanding, a miscalculation. Uh, we've seen also war happening because of nuclear weapons. I mean, the war in Iraq, for example, uh, was because of suspicions of weapons of mass destruction. We're seeing again uh, calls for military conflict with Iran because of nuclear weapons. So it also triggers conflicts. Um, and it doesn't prevent um, it doesn't prevent misunderstandings and, and accidents. And what are we going to do then? How safe are we going to be the day that it actually goes off, for example? And that's something that we, nuclear deterrence, perhaps prevents something some, sometime. I mean, you can, you can bury landmines in your garden and say that it's going to deter from burglary. It's not a good thing anyway. It's not gonna keep us safe. So I think it's, it's important to to realize that. And of course, you know, we would love to see progress on tactical weapons and, and things like that. Uh, we are not against these steps that needs to be taken. I think that's how nuclear weapon states need to move. Uh, but we cannot continue to cling on to that these weapons protect us and keep us safe. Because then we'll never get to, to the goal that we all have subscribed to, a world without nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Um, 
very interesting panel on a very key subject. I'm Espen Bartaida. I was Norway's defense and foreign <laughs> minister, and hence a, a colleague of my good friend Radek Sikorsky. Uh, but I was also foreign minister when uh, Norway launched a humanitarian initiative, which uh, was the start that led to what is now the uh, ICANN Peace Prize, uh, in a sense. So I have a dilemma, and I have to be open about the dilemma, <laughs> because I fundamentally agree with Beatrice Finn and ICANN's cause that the world has become way too dependent on nuclear weapons, and we have a, we have a shared responsibility in getting out of this. I also agree with uh, Mr. Rakpar and Radak that you can't do this from today to tomorrow. So you need to find a path. I don't think Beatrice is saying that either. You yeah. have to find a path out of that. And a very crucial element is exactly to, uh, and, and here I agree with, uh, with um, uh, Radek, um, the, the first thing I would do is to make sure that we stop the production of usable weapons. Because I, I, I would actually prefer a world where we only have those that you can only use in such an extreme case that you won't actually use them. The old ICBMs, then Armageddon is loose. But the tactical bunker buster small weapons is the most dangerous weapon because certainly this may be tempted to use it saying it's just a small thing. If they're used, the taboo is broken and we're in a much, much more dangerous world. So that's a good start. But I also think that we who are either nuclear states or allied with nuclear states, we have to be more creative in thinking how we can contribute to create that transition that makes it possible. Uh, and, and one of them, of course, is to ensure that, the, that rel relevant deterrence can be achieved without resorting to nuclear weapons. It's also investment in conventional arms, that you, that you have a much higher threshold because you don't need to make the choice between being invaded and using nuclear weapons as easily as has been traditional. So my point is that we need, I would just, that was a little long, but I strongly support what I can want to do. Uh, at the same time, I cannot recommend my own countries to sign the treaty today, but I very much want us to create that transitional circumstance that delegitimizes any actual use mm -hmm. and eventually makes it obsolete. And my very final point is that current wars are not like 1945 or the Cold War. A number of the hawks of the old Cold War argue, uh, uh, really sort of the really right-wing hawks of the US and UK and other Western countries are saying they were useful, we're not convinced they are as useful any longer. So that's also an important part of the discussion. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, Hideo Uzaki. I'm a governor of Hiroshima Prefecture. And uh, you know, first I'd like to say that uh, uh, to discuss uh, about nuclear weapons, we need to recognize what the reality of the use of nuclear weapons is. So I recommend everyone to visit Nagasaki or Hiroshima to see the reality of the use of the nuclear weapons. And I think there are two very important issues. Uh, one is about deterrence uh, that we've been discussing. And you know, deterrence cannot be uh, discuss as just deterrence, but we need to uh, uh, kind of go into details of uh, deterrence again, who and what, etc. And it's they are all different. Uh, you know, the Indian situation, the U.S., Norway, Japan, they're all different. So we need to kind of scrutinize what the de deterrence re really is. And uh, second uh, uh, issue is uh, the step by step. Uh, I think uh, there are no uh, actions in the steps by the nuclear weapon states have triggered such dissatisfaction among non-nuclear states. And so it's, I think, now time for nuclear weapon states to, to uh, you know, seriously uh, show uh, what are the steps and, uh, and what they are going to do with it. So. <coughs> In Hiroshima last year, we had a, a, a round table discussion among experts, and there were two recommendations, and one was uh, about deterrence, and another was uh, uh, step by step. We uh, had a recommendation uh, to, uh, for uh, nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear uh, weapon states who are under umbrella uh, get together to discuss what the steps are really, and, and show the world uh, they're going to take those steps. So I have a question to uh, uh, Minister Akbar. You know, wha how do you, uh, what would you say to that recommendation, you know, getting, uh, I mean, nuclear weapon states getting together to discuss seriously about the steps? Because 
it's too vague, you know, uh, at this point, but we need to see it uh, seriously. Uh, sir, in the, in the multilateral frameworks, and after all, we are talking about a multilateral problem. Uh, in the multilateral framework, uh, there are institutions, and uh, <coughs> the first committee is called first for a valid reason at the UN. And the very first step, indeed, has to be to talk. And talk, I think, in practical terms, in realistic terms, right? Deterrence is not that difficult to recognize. I won't say more, except uh, I suggest everybody looks at a map. So, uh, but yes, all I'm trying to suggest, we, and we are very proud of the fact that our objective is peace. Our objective is demilitarization of this. I'm glad some other issues have been raised here, which I might have said not been so uh, proactive in doing, but they are realistic. Some of the issues there are of the nature of weapons, what can be done, what can be done about first use, and so on. So there are very practical steps forward. And I hope that this process uh, will, uh, will germinate and become uh, realistic. But I do want to say uh, that uh, we want peace, but peace doesn't come necessarily through pacifism. So I'm a business school professor. I know very little about nuclear proliferation or its ending. But I have a few questions. I, have a, I grew up in India, a nuclear state. I live in the United States, another nuclear state. Um, India could lead. Uh, Mohandas Karabjan Gandhi did. India could unilaterally uh, not develop nuclear weapons. So could the US. But I, have a, I don't want to make a statement. Assume for a moment that a country uses a nuclear weapon. Assume al also for a moment that you could not deter a suicide bomber you could stop him or her. What will happen to the country that uses a nuclear weapon? You are on the spot. <laughs> Since uh, we are a small nuclear state, the answer must lie this way. is also very good at not being provoked. Oh, oh. <laughs> 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 I Ken Choi from Chosun Daily Newspaper, Korea. Uh, Yuichi, you're a foremost expert on North Korean nuclear issues, and you wrote extensive 600 pages book uh, about North Korean nuclear issues. And uh, recently, New York Times reported that the, the U.S. military is preparing unwanted war that could happen in North Korea, meaning that that Trump, President Trump might order uh, bombing North Korea. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, what is the likelihood of actually that thing, that scenario would happen? And uh, uh, to Minister and Beatrice, Ms. Finn, uh, what could be the international sort of coalition or efforts to sort of denuclearize, or at least pulling North Korea out of the pathway that it's going. Because uh, right now, it seems like you know, North Korea is only trying to deal with the US or South Korea or whatever, and the international community is not really there. And even if there is a sort of a six-party talks, uh, it's almost a malfunction. It's not working uh, what it's supposed to be doing. And uh, I'm just wondering, uh, we talked about all good things, about how international community can come up with creative ideas to, you know, sort of uh, denuclearize or at least pulling the, the world away from the nuclear, possible nuclear war. But uh, it seems like, you know, there's no international community dealing with North Korean issues except the UN sanctions and stuff like that. So first, I want to ask Richie and then the other questions to the other. Well, Ken, uh, thank you for your uh, <coughs> question, but uh, I do not want to thank for your tough question. Uh, because I cannot forecast, and I wouldn't. 
uh, but I can uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, try to articulate uh, what uh, is that politically impossible here. Um, I think I can uh, envision first United States will have to factor that South Korean people's fear and the determination not to get uh, involved in war they cannot control. Okay? And I do not think that the Moon Jae-in government will allow Trump administration uh, to strike North Korea unilaterally. Uh, if they would, if the United States would, that would be the end of that ROK US alliance. That would be too costly. Uh, I don't think the rational mind uh, would uh, pursue that uh, option. Uh, I think Mattis, Tillerson, uh, and generals are uh, not interested in uh, opting that this uh, military uh, solution. I'm not so sure about uh, President Trump. Uh, as I said, it's very dangerous because he be seems to believe in this unpredictability, uh, giving him some leverage. I think that's a, a grave mistake, and it could have uh, caused consequences. So uh, I would not rule out any possibility of a military option uh, of uh, 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 the Trump administration. But I, I cannot say when, how uh, that the Trump administration was uh, uh, waged war. I think it would also uh, strain the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance uh, almost irreparably. Uh, I do not think that Japanese government, whether it's under Abe or not, uh, will uh, accept that unilateral military strike uh, on the North Korea without being consulted. And when Japan would be consulted, I would say they would say no. Hi. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Oh. Um, just yeah, quick response to that. Um, I think obviously um, there needs to be negotiations with North Korea. Uh, we need to find a diplomatic solution to to the issue. Um, they are a nuclear armed state. I think this whole question about should we accept it or not accept it. I mean, they are. It's 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 going to take more than just. Uh, a quick negotiations to, to get rid of their nuclear weapons. And for me, it's, I think it's just, um, we might be able to, to solve it through negotiations in the way that we solved, uh, the Iran, we had an Iran deal, which was very positive, but it's just a temporary solution. Uh, there will always be countries wanting nuclear weapons as long as we don't, if we don't address the actual threat. So, and that brings me to the question about what would happen if someone actually uses nuclear weapons, which is really, I am convinced that also the nuclear armed states will prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons. The question is, do we do it before or after they are used again? Because if they are used, uh, and not only are the consequences going to be so obvious for everyone, we're going to be reminded that this is not theory. This is a real weapon with real people. Uh, the world looks very different than 1945. The impact on Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, were devastating, but imagine uh, a city that is much more dense, that is built in a, in a different way. I mean, the consequences would be so devastating that, uh, I mean, it would, it would change everything, of course. The question is, would it trigger nuclear war uh, with multiple exchanges, or will it be a one-off? Uh, uh, it's difficult to imagine. And I think that there were comments about how we have to encourage the nuclear armed states to lead at this point. They need to sit down and start negotiating. And they're not gonna do that just by themselves. <coughs> We had eight years of the most progressive American president on nuclear weapons, someone who came into power and sat for eight years and had a vision and wanted to do something and, you know, what happened? Not very much. Uh, we cannot just wait for them. We cannot just sit around and hope that leaders will do the right thing because these countries, how reasonable they might be, might, you know, elect an unreasonable leader suddenly. And I think that's really why we need to mobilize countries uh, around the nuclear weapon states to make it more politically costly to threaten to use weapons of mass destruction, uh, to really put pressure on these countries. This issue is not gonna be solved by leaders. 
it's going to solve, you know, the leaders are going to solve it when they feel forced to solve it. And we have to force them before the forcing power is the actual use of nuclear weapons. Thank you. I'm Deb O'Hara Ruskowski, and I'm a delegate at the United Nations, and I just have a few points to make. Um, the ideal goal that we talk about of denuclearization, certainly altruistic, but unrealistic, as, as many of you have noted. Um, given Rex Tillerson's statement to the member states last uh, few months ago, no, nego ne no negotiations will take place unless the states come to the table to really discuss denuclearization. So the stability or the, the lack thereof of North Korea's dictator can't be dealt with rationally. Now you can talk about Trump's rhetoric, but he lets North Korea know he will act in response to him. And perhaps maybe the only way he will listen, not do as I say, or do as I say, not as I do. Um, we've seen what happened in the last administration strategy, which did not reduce anything and was rather North Korea built up arsenal proliferation, increased testing, increased mileage, enough to point to New York and Washington. And coupled with the former Secretary of State uranium deal, basically uh, gave Iran the ability to expand the nuclear ars arsenal. So I agree with the old weaponry um, statistics of mass, uh, weapons of mass destruction, and as a healthcare provider myself, I agree with the horrific results on humankind for decades. But what other deterrent, what else can we do in dealing with unstable leaders? And I'm not just talking about Trump. of my viewpoint. Uh, if you have to take a take away from this, I would go back to say that if the process is to move forward, if the process is to be credible, if the process has to be step by step, then we must agree on three tangibles. One, the process must be universal. <coughs> Number two, the process must be non-discriminatory. And number three, the process must be verified. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, uh, even though we uh, <coughs> should uh, be focused on the, the ultimate goal of uh, nuclear free world, and uh, uh, I think we should maintain that uh, goal. At the same time, uh, we also have to address that uh, current most urgent issues, uh, particularly in East Asia, how to uh, dismantle North Korea's nuclear capability and program. Uh, the, what has to be asked is that, you know, uh, are that sanctions enough? Uh, what sort of pressures will get through uh, to Pyongyang and, uh, you know, uh, can the regional players let themselves be in a position of black, nuclear blackmail that missile defense have been put in place, but North Korea's uh, nuclear and missile programs continue to make progress so that the defenses uh, look, you know, uh, woofery and prepared. So we really have to address those urgent issues right now. That's the meaning of step-by-step -step solution. But eventually, I think we have to get North Korea to come back to the table. A military option is, I think, is not an option. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't call disarmament unrealistic or irrational. The fact is that the majority of states in the world are able to ensure their security and defend themselves without threatening to indiscriminately slaughter civilians with weapons of mass destruction. And it really means that we, we have a choice right now. We can choose to move towards disarmament and end nuclear weapons, or we keep them and they will be used. 
if you choose to keep them, they will be used. And, you know, who's the irrational one here, to be honest? Thank you, thank you so much, everyone, the whole panel. This is